Hello, welcome back. Welcome to Fireside with Peter Adgis on Gen Con TV. On this show, we are continuing our search for the untold stories behind your favorite games, especially in the world of Dungeons and Dragons. We have teamed up with the Dungeon Masters Guild, who has been introducing us to new voices in Dungeons and Dragons. And our guest for this episode is Willie Abiel. And Willie has a long list of credits. He's working on all sorts of stuff, the Book of House, which I'm really looking forward to, uh, culinary weapons, and necromancy can be good um yeah. i suspect there's more to learn about that <laughs> willie willie thank you for joining us what is good <laughs> what is good house is good yes yes okay i'm supposed to start with the biographical stuff but i i want to cut right to the book of house and uh because like i i've been really been looking forward to this because I'm a, I'm a big house music fan i've been i used to um well i i used to go to clubs a lot back when i was younger and um you know <laughs> disco never died it just came back as house disco music. clearly never died no 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 disco i love love disco love house uh so what do you do in the in the book of house do you like uh do you go to you play djs and you go to clubbing i mean what what is um how do you work this into fifth edition generally speaking you walk into the house and you're just smack dab in the middle of a bunch of clowns because hey this is the kind of dance party you're stepping into here clowns oh it's clowns. more like the rave scene then yeah rave exactly scene. <laughs> bright colors just baggy pants it's 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 a whole bunch of fun oh i have definitely okay that now we're deep into playa territory this is like burning man territory okay. yeah <laughs> I'm there. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, um, <clears throat> um, okay, good. So actually, let's do go back to our proper agenda here. So Willie, uh, where are you from? I like to start off with a little bit of like, who is Willie Abiel? Like, where, where, where do you hail from? Where were you raised? Um, I have been in New Jersey for all of my life. So. Oh, oh this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just this one. Uh, the previous ones, I don't know where I was at, but for this one, I've I've been living in New Jersey. So, okay. Uh, so, mm -hmm. um, did you uh, were you raised in a family playing games? Did you? Uh, so my older brother played video games, and actually, how I got my start into video games in particular was that I was always trying to sneak into his room and watch him play. But one day he locked the door on me, and like I would scream to the little door, not like the keyhole. And he thought I was screaming at one point, but I'd stuck my eye into the keyhole, and then he sprayed me with cologne. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> left an impression. I never left video games since. So. You never liked video games since. No, I never left video games. Never left. I was just hooked at that point. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Everybody has you know, what it is that drew them in. It was the scent, of, apparently. Um, I guess so. <laughs> I just smelt it in my eye. <clears throat> I I had a um I had a little sister I had to keep out of my room as well. And um uh I had this um uh pottery, uh, you know, roadside pottery I bought while down in the southwest somewhere of a of a snake, like this big vicious looking cobra snake all coiled up, ready to strike. And I just put that in the entrance of my room and it kept my sister out for years. It worked. It worked. And I felt <laughs> and she, she claims all sorts of mental damage from this Aww. and other problems. It, it, we won't go into it. There was a long <laughs> history of older brother pranksterism that um I will carry your guilt to my grave. <laughs> okay, so we know how you got into video games. How did you get into tabletop RPGs? Since that's what we're here to discuss. That's fair. Um, it's actually kind of interesting. My story is mostly entwined with D and D. Um, I want to say, how old was I? It's got to be like third or fourth grade elementary okay. school. Okay. And it was myself and three other friends, elementary school kids. And like, we're just playing a game of three, five. Okay. And at that point I'm like, Whoa, this is cool. I'm a wizard. This rules. I'm a wizard who can stab people. This is cool. We never played again, but I bought like a whole bunch of books. I like looked into Eberron from that point. I was looking at all the art. I was just amazed. I was like, you know what? I don't see this option. I, I want to be able to be a dragon. And it's like, okay, I looked online. Oh, I see dragon options that are probably horribly unbalanced. Um, I ended up creating my own berserker and I still didn't play the game at all. I had no one else to play with from that point onward until like after college. 
So, so, so <laughs> let, let, let's come back to that. that okay. Yeah. So, but, but the grade school fascination, um, that's fascinating. 3.5 era, by the way, good, good, good addition. Um, fun year. <laughs> what? A fine year. A fine year. A very fine year. It was a very fine edition. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, I have a running gag with uh, my dear friend and colleague, Derek, who um, swears fourth edition was much better. And um, But I've, I've gotten most of my guests to attest that, no, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, you went off to college. What, what did you study in, in college? Where, where was your heart taking you in academically? Right. Um, so like I was saying before, I was kind of into the whole video game sphere, right? Yeah. So sure. I went to a communications high school. I wanted to basically be able to get into a whole bunch of different medias, learn how to do uh, VC, visual communications, graphic design, and what have you. Then I went to college for computer science so I can like not necessarily become a programmer, but be able to speak to programmers, right? So I would actually right. just kind of be in that mentality of being able to work on a team to make video games. I wanted to be a game designer. Um, and I kind of stuck through that, like to that throughout college, ended up in a UX job after college, but, uh, yeah, I didn't come back to tabletop until like a couple of years outside of my studies. So, okay. So, so, uh, okay. So that's, that's great. Now you're still in New Jersey at this time, all throughout mm -hmm. this whole, whole, whole time. And, uh, New York almost got me. We're like right there on the border over in Jersey city, Hoboken area. So, all right. Cool. So, um, so how'd you get back into Dungeons and Dragons? Um, it just so happened. Um, had a group that was ready to play, and it's like, whoa, I'm getting back into this. Fifth edition is looking pretty cool. I can figure this out. Let's let's just get to it. And we jumped right, right into uh, Curse of Strahd. So you point. skip you skipped fourth edition completely. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> Derek is, I don't think Derek's on. Darn. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, you went to fifth edition. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I agree. I think the odd numbered editions are generally best. Um, okay, so. <laughs> I'll have to go back to OD and D then. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> no, you can skip OD and D. Trust me. <laughs> uh, first edition, AD and D. Uh, it depends on how you number it, right? Because there was this whole, anyway, let's not go there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the um uh okay so yeah tell me about getting back into it um it was just really fun to actually have people to play with at this point because it felt like i kind of missed the boat the first time around that i was on it i managed to jump off of it and it's like oh all these feelings is sort of like sense of being in a tabletop game role playing it it it, it, it was refreshing um, but then that group sort of dissipated and I had to fend for myself and I ended up becoming basically a DM. And but before we leave that very first, so your first time playing it as fifth edition after college was your second time playing it period, right? Cause you only played it the one time back in high school. I mean, you might've, I don't know, you might've cheated once or twice, but you know, yeah, that was, <laughs> <laughs> so what did you I, I find this a, a weird question I ask guests sure. sometimes. Um, uh, for me, it was really hard to get my head around. I mean, there was a there was a there was a period where I was playing Dungeons and Dragons like a, a war game, like a, like yeah. a, or a board game. Like it was just like the game session started with the characters at the entrance of the dungeon, and you're keeping track of turns, and they're going through the dungeon and, and fighting monsters, collecting treasure, and going levels. I mean, that was all there was to it, right? And um, uh, uh, the idea of really the role playing did did you have a fundamental grasp of that immediately, or did it take time to sink in? It didn't take a lot of time. Um, I definitely played it more like a war game or a tactics game. Um, I, I've played video games that are in the same genre, right? You have your Final Fantasy tactics, um, your Disgaea's, your Fire Emblems and what have you that are in a very similar sort of, or have very similar origins to basically. Right, D &D. sure. They grew out of Dungeons and Dragons. To be exactly. Honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, but, but those, are I, not, those are not great examples of what, I think you and I would think of as a role-playing thing, right? Right. Their adventure, pick a path, sort of. 
exactly um but i enjoyed sort of like the character building aspect like oh hey i'm gonna get this sort of kit or i'm gonna have these sort of mechanics at my disposal um playing with a group that was a little bit more focused on role playing caused me to kind of like think about it more flavorfully like okay so my character is going to have to do this in this way and like let's let's roll with that why would i do it like this and i kind of got into sort of the role and actually right. started role playing rather than just playing a game so and is that when it became much more exciting for you more interesting for you um, it was definitely a lot more engaging at that point. Like I still, I still enjoy like theory crafting and putting together sort of builds and what have you. But uh, uh, I, I do have a certain fondness, fondness once I'm actually into like the persona of the character. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. So you were about to tell me about um, having to take over DMing the group. That's right. Um, yeah, ended up finding a whole bunch of uh, folks, started playing uh, Minds of Van Delver, turned it into a Western sort of campaign, loosely. But, you know, Cowboys, it's kind of fun. Um, sure. Yeah, eventually got my partner, Leon, um, and then we were both playing and we were also starting to design our own stuff for D&D proper. And I'm not too sure about timelines because time doesn't exist anymore. Eventually the book of house kind of came out after that. So. Right. All right. So tell us about the book of house for real this time. I, uh, right. All right. I, I hope I didn't offend you with my gag. At, uh, <laughs> I, I just, I just saw the book of house. It really was my first reaction. The book of house. Oh my gosh. Uh, about dance music. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Of course it was all about house music in the first place. Mm -mm -mm. No, but I enjoy like the, the gamey aspect, you know, pranking around and whatnot, because a big part of the book of house has to do with clowns or clown people, the clown. Right. Um, and that's sort of where the book of house started, right? Like I wanted to put together sort of this PC race option for the game that would kind of have its own sort of niche and Leanne and I will go back and forth about the actual origins of where the clan came from in particular. But one of those origins was, you know, something that could stand amongst the Tolkien roster, right? That would be distinguishable. So, you know, big red nose, big ears. It's like, okay, well, let's, let's go with a clown person. Um, and from there, just more ideas kind of got stacked on top of it. What were other sort of interesting things I wanted to do with the game? Like you have the Tula, which are a spider people because I wanted multiple arms. How do you play with multiple arms within 5e? Or the Sprite, um, you know, tiny little pixie-like characters. How do you play as a tiny character? Um, and just sort of like figuring out the mechanics for that. And the book became a mess. Um, generally speaking, we loosely managed to find a theme around it because the titular character, uh, Sir House, which is actually his name, not necessarily right. a genre of music in this case, is sort of a scatterbrained person, right? But super right. observant. And we were like, okay, here are a bunch of things that Sir House has found. that He's looked very closely at that people might not have uh, looked at before. And we were able to put together this big splat book. And it was really cool. Okay, so... I, I I'm I'm most curious about the uh, you said clowns is that the correct pronunciation clown yep yep okay. yep yep so I will clown. not show clown people pictures on the stream in case people are watching us right now <laughs> <laughs> okay so um the race of clowns so I mean you know when I think of a clown of course I'm naturally drawn to um, the circus sort of interpretation with mm -hmm. the makeup and the big nose and the wig and the funny clothes. Um, so is this a race where the, um, uh, the, what these people look like is that, of course they probably have to buy their own clothes, but. Um, <laughs> Generally speaking, yeah. yeah. Um, I went into the <clears throat> deep end looking up clown lore um, just looking up various uh, Good, really. renditions. Huh? Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, going off the into a, a deep end rabbit hole. Uh, that that this is what <laughs> sign is all about. You're yes, yes. Go, please continue. Yeah, but like clowns across the world, right? There are many different interpretations. They have many different functions. Generally, all tied around this idea of being an exaggerated mirror upon society. And it's like, okay, cool. 
So let's make them into a cartoony version of sort of any of the other character options that are out there. So you have these exaggerated sort of features. They have long arms, they have big feet, big hands, rosy features and whatnot. And they're super durable because they're used to doing like buffoonery and like getting smacked around and what have you. Yeah, bowling pins to the head and all that sort of stuff. And after a certain level, I mean, well, well let me go, let me backtrack a little bit yes in please. addition to that because they are sort of a facsimile of like anything you throw at them i basically well we made them into a jack of all trades right they're able to basically perform any sort of role like you can have a fireman clown or a hobo clown or what have you like clowns are satirical of a whole bunch of different professions so like oh hey they don't necessarily have their own niche but they're able to do all these things to a moderate degree right Right. And then from there, we just exaggerated it even further. We allowed them to sort of inflate themselves like a balloon, stretch out, grow. It, it, it just became a fun project, like starting off with a clown and letting your mind go. Like, what else can these things do? Right. Right. Wow. OK, so um, uh, would you uh, recommend playing like a like if, a, um, if I was a GM and I was going to run a, a, a group and use the, the Book of House? Would I have all the player characters roll up clones, or would I just throw one in there with you know just a standard fighter, ranger, thief, wizard? I think that depends on the tolerance of everyone else who's playing. Um, oh, generally yeah. speaking, a lot of people do have that fear of clowns, right? But we put a whole bunch of different like lore and features into the clones themselves. You can play it to any amount of clowniness you want so you could play a serious character in fact in my home games a lot of my characters well not necessarily serious my clowns are generally like my dwarves or my elves they're just normal characters within this world and what have you right um but i would say hey you can have one maybe even two clowns in a party and it'll be a good time <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I might start with a clon NPC and see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of good luck with that. Um, one of my favorite clon NPCs is this bartender named Luigi. And he talks like this, very big guy, very supportive, what have you. And he makes funny jokes from time to time. You know, he has a bit of a sense of humor. <laughs> but, you know, very light, enough to get your feet wet in clown them. So yes. Yeah, ah, that sounds perfect. That sounds perfect. Uh, yeah, I think um, I'm imagining like an like a um, an elf clown. Ooh, <laughs> out in the woods, like oh yeah, you run into an elf. Oh wait, catch. <laughs> this is a horror. <laughs> you don't normally like to find clowns out in the woods. I, I found in a dark. Yes, in a very dark uh so i assume that this game um do you encourage this game uh to go dark at times i mean you kind of uh embrace that within the narrative of the book that um uh if you want to go into the scary side of clowns uh here's here's where to go absolutely like i'm not going to be able to predict what kind of game you want to play if you want to use my stuff um but i can account for as much as possible right? right and you do have sort of your twisted humors uh basically clans who are absolutely just on the far reaches of their wits end and they are super horrifying like uh, i don't know the best way to describe them but uh generally speaking it's it's kind of like that horror narrative they have an ability called running joke where if you think that you actually knocked them to zero they manage to come back up with one hp Right. And it's like setting up that narrative, like, oh, I'm going to get you and whatnot. <laughs> um, and you can play like that if you want to. Sure. So like, I'm not going to make any judgment about the way you want to play. Well, I, 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 I feel like there's this little clock inside of me, like move on talk about something else too. But I got to ask one more question about, sure. <laughs> about the, uh, the book of house. Um, you talked at the beginning about clowns being a satire on life. Um, Aside from just the visualization of the clans and, and what they look like, um, do you 
um, do you address the topic of satire in some other way? Yes. So we kind of built out like the whole first chapter of the book of house is sort of about clans and clan culture. Like what, what does it mean to be inside of a clannish sort of world? Um, and generally speaking, it's, it's sort of like they're gripping with the fact that um, they're able to do a whole bunch of things, but they don't necessarily have their own niche in the world yet. So they're still trying out a whole bunch of different things as best they can. And they kind of spread themselves thin. And in that way, they do become sort of a satire of the other existing sort of people that are in the world. Right? Right. Because everybody's looking for their place. Exactly. Um, for the most part, you can associate uh, general commonalities or stereotypes with, oh, the dwarves are the blacksmiths and what have you. So, right. Um, it, it goes into that. And I think we did a pretty decent job of sort of describing what would a society look like with that as sort of the backbone of their culture. I find it interesting because, you know, these more philosophical um, edges of life and Dungeons and, you know, and Dungeons and Dragons, of course, is a simulation of, a, of, of the world and everything that we have in our world and everything that we deal with. Um, and sometimes the more esoteric notions are, um, you know, we, we need help as GMs figuring out how do we bring these topics and how exactly. do we have a, 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 you know, maybe most of the time, you know, I'm, you know, games, you know, maybe should be light and fun and, and airy, but um, uh, once in a while, it's good to, um, try and um go into something more serious so absolutely and i've found i mean just kind of watching it's been how many years since we released mm, about two years nonetheless but like looking at people's reception to the book of house and how they like integrate clans or clowns into their own games some of them just throw all the lore out the window and they're like oh i just want to play a funny clown man and and it's cool, but also there are folks who do embrace what we've given to them. Take the characters, the famous individuals that we name in the book, and kind of weave their own stories around that. Man, it's it's cool from both ends. Oh yeah, yeah. There's nothing. Um, uh, there's nothing better, and at times also nothing more surreal than somebody playing one of your games. Yeah, <laughs> I won't get used to it. Oh, you, oh no, you you won't. I, I know. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I haven't made a game in a long time, so I don't know why I'm talking. But anyway, <laughs> um, okay. So hey, uh, but you have a lot of other great things in the book of house. I mean, it's not just the clans. I mean, we I, I grabbed onto that because it's so unique. Um, uh, the um, uh, which uh, which other bit should we cover before? What would you like to talk about in this? The the Tula or? The... Well, I mean, the Tula are just spider folk. Uh, generally speaking, I was very fond back in three five of uh, the Thrycreen, Tricreen, no Thrycreen. Yeah, um, like that, yeah. And it's like, oh my goodness, how do I play as this uh, monster option back in three five? Oh, this is kind of complicated, but it's not going to matter anyway because I'm not going to play this game for another decade or so later. But aside the point, it's like, okay how do we do a multi-arm sort of option in 5e and let's not necessarily put it up to Thrycreen. Let's not make recreate the Thrycreen because it might not live right. up to that standard. Let's make something new. And it's like spiders have more arms. Let's go with that. Right. Right. I mean, do you, you, do, um, um, you seem to have a, a, there's a thread here of topics that, or, or races, if you will, that, um, uh, that people have terrors about, right? Clowns, spiders. <laughs> uh, do you have a snake? Do you have, is there a snake uh, race in here somewhere? <laughs> there is not a snake, but in the lycanthrope section, we do have the were hornet. And I oh. have heard, I've gotten reception that that is indeed horrifying. So, you know, we, we yeah. stuck to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And were sharks and were octopuses. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, well, since you have, okay, so let's talk about that for a moment. Since you have this theme of lycanthrope characters in House of, in Book of House, um, I, I got to back up and say, is there um, some thread within that topic that you've embraced? Like, what you have a take on lycanthropy that um, we can explore here? Yeah. Um, so the character himself, right? I got the book right here. Yes. This guy oh. is Sir House. Uh, yes. Yeah, there we go. Yep, Sir House. Yep. Um, and he's wearing that sort of plague mask, you can tell. 
Um, yep. Well, he himself is a were raven, and it's like, okay, let's let's explore um, more about more wear options at that point because he's got to have a few ideas of what it's like to be a lycanthrope it certainly would be interesting to kind of explore that from both a narrative sense and from a mechanic sense explore what's in the rules currently and expand upon that so can you um share anything with you with me about sort of mechanically like um uh what you advise gms for how to run lycanthrope in pcs or pcs uh yes so it's definitely on the stronger side in fact there is a forewarning within the book that says hey maybe not necessarily play this at like your level one or your level two sort of game but like anywhere after that it sort of mellows out and is just as balanced throughout the rest of the book but we made it so that it's enticing to want to be sort of aware person um, with also this interesting drawback where, oh, hey, if you go down, you're going to lose control over what is essentially a curse, right? Right. Um, and you start to sort of regress into a more of a feral state. And we kind of repurpose the madness table into a feral regression table. Um, so okay. that if you were to go down a couple of times, eventually you're just going to go out the window. You're, you're done. But you still have all these cool abilities you can transform into a mighty creature with their own special sort of like actions and what have you and you can also inflict curses on other people if you're inclined but you know there are morality considerations to make but yeah there are yeah yeah it's yes <laughs> so, uh hey i forgot to ask you something earlier on i i usually like to ask so how did you transition from being you know a, a ux designer a, a video game lover fan of dungeons and dragons to uh to becoming uh professionally involved with dungeons and dragons and becoming a publisher it was accessible right um we had just finished off uh, a small little game. It's called Yeah Jam Fury. It's it's on PC. It's it's fun. It's mechanically exciting. Very proud of that game. Um, but then the lead programmer on that project, Greg, he he's working on a bunch of his own stuff as well. Um, so in lieu of a main programmer, we had Dungeons and Dragons, and that requires a text editor and understanding of the game. And I, I can do that. So started working, just sort of crunching, trying to figure out what um, Wizards puts out and figuring out like the juice behind that. Like, okay, well, I can match up to that sort of standard and sort of reverse engineering what they do to create my own stuff and then putting it out there and people like it. And Leon's been a writer. Um, they took to it like a fish in water and they're creating really cool adventures right now too. So we, we just kind of bounce back and forth off of each other, making more and more stuff. And it's, it's easy to have that sort of support doing it. So you tend to collaborate, uh, collaborate with them on most of your projects. Mm -hmm. And which, uh, just for curious, I, which was, what was your first project? Um, the first one was definitely the Book of House. It was the Book of House. Okay. Yep. Okay. Oh, we actually inadvertently did just in the right order. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just, doing it right. Just didn't ask the right question about how you got into it. So. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. So, what 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 did you write next? What? And, well, first of all, how did that go? I mean, it is like the, What was your initial feeling about the prospect? You know, the the you know this project of like okay, taking this this um this big project. I mean, it feels to me like a pretty big project for a first book. It's, it's pretty big. Um, working with all the artists, like sort of researching, Oh, who can I contact? Who's going to be available for this? Okay. Do I have enough budget for this? No. Okay. We're going to make this work anyway. And putting it all together. It, it took a while. Um, right. It took a good amount of time, but we managed to pull it off. And at that point it's like, Whew, let's do this smarter next time. And right. I think we've only done smaller projects since, although I'm chomping at the bit to eventually do another big project like the Book of House. But got to wait until time sort of opens up for that at the moment. So uh, um, you were happy with how it was received then? And Absolutely. Um, at one point, uh, our options kind of 
got caught on Google Trends and managed to sort of like get picked up by a bunch of people really quickly. Uh, there was a viral Tumblr post that managed to go around because uh, one of the pieces of art in the book depicts uh, the College of Culinary, who is uh, not Guy Fieri, but absolutely Guy Fieri. Um, and people like that. And from there, it's like, whoa, a whole bunch of people are enjoying this book now. Oh, a few people are actually picking up D&D for the first time. That's kind of cool. Uh, wow. Um, it was absolutely a success in our eyes, I think. Oh, it's great. Well, that's fantastic. But I mean, I suppose that's why we got connected. But I mean, still, you know, <laughs> good way to go. <laughs> okay, so uh, your second project, where'd you, where'd you move from there? But to, to flush off the success of Book of House, uh, something Making... with more techno in it, maybe. Oh, that'd be nice. Uh, no, uh, we jumped over to... I think we did magic horror items, which is sort of an expansion, a bunch of little clown items, which was fun for a charity thing. Um, but the next project after that was culinary weapons, right? Okay. Um, yeah. I saw this on your list. Culinary yep. weapons. So this does seem like more of a well-bounded project. Like Absolutely. Uh, At you, this... can, you can draw a box around and, and... So Guy Fieri was doing gangbusters for us in the Book of House. So it's like, okay, let's sort of expand upon what we've done with this Bardic College of Culinary, give them a few more tools to play with, maybe expand the mythos of why we put Guy Fieri into our book. Sorry, not Guy Fieri. Twitch, it's not Guy Fieri. His name is Man of Flames. He's a completely different character, original character. Okay. Point. Um, right. So... Culinary weapons is just a bunch of different sort of food tools that are repurposed to be like, oh, hey, you're going into combat. You're on a DAD adventure, right? So how do I use the spatula in battle? And a lot of these items have a lot of interesting sort of mechanical things like the spatula can flip a goblin over, perhaps, if you wanted to. Uh, tongs can keep a person in place. Um, we even have a couple of magic Especially items. Especially if they're a clon, because you can just like tong their nose, right? And exactly. Like... <laughs> um, and there's even two magic items that are effectively just microwaves or a pressure cooker. And we figured out a way to make that work within a middle ages, high fantasy setting. Um, at least I thought it was pretty successful in that regard. Aside the point, um it's like okay you don't have the book of house here's a way to implement all this stuff with just the culinary weapons like here's this feat that allows you to play as this and at the end of the book we have the man of flames oh it's that cool dude that you found from the book of house what's his deal oh he's a planeswalker right uh planescaper he he <laughs> travels to find like the greatest food across the multiverse and we gave him I saw stats. Plains too. Walker there for a second. Yeah, I was excuse me. The, uh, the DM's <laughs> Guild affiliation link <laughs> happened to Dominaria stuff. <laughs> uh, I mean, he, he might have jumped. I, I wouldn't doubt him. Although I do wonder what kind of uh, delicious foods they have in the magic universes, honestly. We find this magical scroll. Tap to do three damage. What? <laughs> 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 but yeah, um, culinary weapons was really cool. And you had this epic level fight with not Guy Fieri in the back of it. And very proud of how that came out too. Got a really good artist on it as well. I hopefully That's did a good enough job on the layout to make sure that their art was like emphasized more. Right. Well, that's good. That's um, uh, great illustrations are, uh, are fantastic. Um, yeah, it almost, um, uh, I f almost feels like a little bit of a martial arts sort of style in a way. Like uh, you could almost yeah. imagine a Jackie Chan movie where it's all like fancy. Uh, so, hey, we had a question from chat uh, from oh. uh, uh, Grin and Greg. Aside uh, from smaller project size, uh, what other lessons did you learn from your first project uh, and that you could apply to your other projects? <sighs> <laughs> mm. you want the whole list or just the top 10 <laughs> scope everything out at the start and really don't inch past that too much because the moment you let yourself have an inch you end up taking a mile um scope yeah uh scope creep happens to all of us it's almost unavoidable unless you're really good at it uh, not good at scope creeping but like good at preventing scope creep uh 
yeah it's like, it's like throwing a spell and reversing it out. it's like can you yeah exactly um i have sort of approached a lot of the projects since then with okay here is my outline i've got usually a spreadsheet like online this is all the stuff i want to do in here and if i'm not working on the project actively i might add a few things to it but once we start working on it it's right. for the most part fixed okay this is what we're going to do don't go past this you can put everything else into an expansion if you really want to um i think having that bound will ensure that you get more projects done right in that regard right I think that's good. I think I think that's good. Is the process? Um, uh, so you you uh, tell me about working with the DMs Guild. Do you um, do you, you get to collaborate on a lot of things? I mean, I we just had that, as you know, uh, you were watching me at Lydia Van Hoy on in a previous episode, and um, she was very excited to have worked with you on was it Fight to the Top? Fight to the Top. Yeah. Um, I want to say that that was probably was it the first major collaboration that I worked on? I mean, I, I've also done Scientific Secrets as well, which was a lot of fun too. That's a really cool series by Zeke. Um, I don't get to collaborate with other people on the DMs Guild as much as I want to, or even should. Um, I definitely want to open myself up to more opportunities in that regard. But being able to talk to other creators on the DMs Guild has always been invaluable. It's always been exciting, uh, cheerleading one another, just sort of like getting behind uh, what makes them tink, tink, not tink. They don't tink. Sometimes they tink. They tink. tank. Tank? You don't want that. That's not I correct. don't want them to tank. No, um, no, you don't want them to tank, but I definitely do want to know how they tick. Um, tick. There we go. That's it. Yeah. How and you work. can absolutely see like individual styles coming out in the projects that they work on. And it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, well, I got, uh, I got to tell you, Willie, I you sold. I, um, uh, this whole season I've been meeting um, designers like yourself from the DMs Guild and it's so <laughs> much fun. I, you know, as uh, I was looking forward to this series um, as when we conceptualized it and working with Lisa Penrose and um, it's, it has been and will continue to be uh, a delight. It's, it's cool. Um, and you get a whole bunch of different styles in there too. And I'm sure as you're discovering, like all of us are coming at this game with sort of a fresh coat of paint. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, it is interesting. Let's, uh, let's go, let's, let's get into that a little bit. Um, I, what I was looking forward to uh, was like as someone who grew up playing D&D &D in 1978 and worked on it professionally in the 90s, um, like what drew me into this topic with, um, uh, for this season was to try to get into the minds of people who are working on Dungeons and Dragons now and coming from uh, different perspectives uh, than the traditional expressive. Uh, so how... How do you think that makes it different? Uh, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind immediately is sort of the culture that we've taken in from the 90s and the oddies. Um, generally speaking, I had Power Rangers and SNES growing up. So like a lot of those influences come out in my work. Um, right. You're going to see a lot of anime influences now, sort of like sure. the bombastic sort of fight scenes um, are absolutely going to shine through in uh, sort of the stuff you see. Um, I'm blanking, but th th that, that's the general idea there. Like the right. sort of stuff that we're consuming now is a lot different to what folks consumed back then when they were first working on the game. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I grew up on, you know, reading Robert E. Howard and um, uh, Paul Anderson and uh, Michael Moorcock and um, uh, very, very different sort of um, collection of inspirations than, uh, uh, than now. So, um, okay. So, uh, okay. I, I got to ask you about necromancy can be good. <laughs> yes. I mean, I've always kind of secretly suspected this, but. Um, oh, me too. I, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to you explaining some of my darker urges here. So, um, 
Generally speaking, my sort of creative style is starting with any sort of spark and letting that just spiral from there. It's not necessarily like, oh, how am I going to scare the players this time? <laughs> no, it, it, uh, it happens that way, sure. Um, but in this case, it was all like, um, let's, let's talk about necromancy. I've seen people discussing it online, whether or not they think it's good or if it's evil. And there are actually a significant amount of, uh, people who go either way. Right. Um, I am a hundred percent of the idea that necromancy is a fine school of magic. Like there's evil people who use it, but like it itself isn't all that bad, but I wanted to put myself into the mindset of someone who did think that. And it's like, okay, what would be appealing to me? What would be the options in necromancy that would allow me to kind of play this in a good way because it is so bad and so evil? Um, hmm. And from there, we came up with about 20 different like utility necromancy spells, uh, put a narrative around it. The narrator is this sort of reanimated individual named Errol Grimm and they have sort of found all these spells by talking to the dead. Um, they kind of go into the history of necromancy um, in the literal sense, in the most literal sense of the term, sort of like divination with the dead. Um, did some research into sort of like the history of necromancy in the real world and what have you, and kind of gave sort of this concrete base from which to create all these uh, new options. Um, and from there, we found that there were opportunities to introduce new character options too, right? Like, oh, hey, say this PC died really early on, but you really like them. Um, here's a spell to let them come back for a day and you can play as them for a little bit. Or, oh, hey, here are the oh. memories of a corpse. <laughs> um, let's, let's play as just those memories in physical form. How would that go? And what would they remember? And what sort of like psychological torture would they go through? Oh, um, this is sounding really good. Yeah. Got sure. stats for that too. No, it's all good. You know, the, the corpse is fine. We're just taking the memories out. It's, 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 it's cool. It's, it's, it's illegal. <laughs> but uh, yeah, really proud of how that turned out. Um, it was a smaller scope. It's like, okay, we're only working on spells. And then, yeah, some scope creep came in, got a few character options in there. But uh, it was doable. And it tested pretty well. And we put together a mighty fine book. You know, I'm I'm thinking about um, Egyptian mythology. You know, mm. from uh, real, real world Egyptian going back to say the time of the New Kingdom or something, where um, uh, a lot of what happened, a, a lot of their uh, cultural and ritual was about inscribing spells on the inside of coffins to protect someone in the afterlife. You know, uh, and uh, that's where my mind went because I I think well that honest I mean that sounds righteous actually i mean to protect someone uh if a necromancer if, if if one sort of angle of necromancy was to help the dead whatever's next for it to develop in a way that's a positive as positive as it can get right right so that did spark something else about the book that I just remembered, although it is a little bit in the opposite direction. And I'm going to spoil a little bit because this is something that we kind of did with the book of house as well, where the book itself sort of has a physicality in the world that you're playing in. Um, there is a spell that allows you to sort of like seal yourself to an object, right? You create this wax seal, you put it on an object. And <laughs> if your body just ends up getting deceased, your soul will get, put back into this safe spot so that you can come back and retrieve it later through some means possible. And Errol, who create or basically made this book, sealed themselves into this book. Um, in fact, oh. if you look, there are there's a brand new seal on the back page. Um, and if you look really carefully, there is some text up at the back page that's backwards. Um, so if you were to kind of look into it, you can find out that, oh, hey, Errol is here and they're able to help you out if you have this book. And it includes a cool magic item you can use in-game oh, for doing stuff. So. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, perfect. That's nice. Uh, that's a fun Lisa. Oh, hey, Lisa's with us. Hi, Lisa. Uh, What's good, Lisa? 
<laughs> Lisa, we were, I don't know if you just came on or what, uh, but we were talking about how much um, uh, we've enjoyed working with the DMs Guild and how much I've enjoyed uh, meeting all the guests that uh, you've sent our way. So, uh, okay. Well, you have me sort of convinced that maybe necromancy can be good. <laughs> Might have to read it. <laughs> yeah, no, I look for that. That sounds, uh, that sounds great. Um, would you like to talk about the dab? <gasps> yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, right, let's uh, stick to this idea that, oh, hey, I have a spark. And then I just spiral out of control from that spot. Yes, yes, yes. So uh -huh. We start off with this meme. Oh, hey, it is a frog on a unicycle. Here comes that boy. Uh, what up? You know, just keeping it PG here in this case. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a meme. And it's like, okay, cool. Let's turn this into sort of an option that you can play with any sort of game within D&D. How would you go about that while still keeping it true to the fact that, oh, it's, it's just a meme um created this race of folk that are the dab and they have their own unique culture it's rich it's their gearheads they like to work with wheels their mechanics they're very interested about creating more stuff um but at the same time they has the fact that they're called the dab for instance they have these sort of jokes that are laced in there as naturally as possible um and oh, okay I'm, i missed the joke here maybe i'm not caught up on the right uh lingo here what the what's the joke about the dab fill it out for me i'm sorry leon am i gonna dab on stream <laughs> okay so you know it's all right so it's it's a motion that you make don't worry about it um at this point it's like oh it's the perfect name for this this character option and we kind of ran with it. it it felt sort of dank it felt like sort of that froggy sort of it felt froggy enough to put into this uh, frog option. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. From there, we kept it as meme as possible. There we go. Okay. Uh, I think I'm with you. Uh, so, are are, are the uh, are are the frogs small or are they like humanish sized? They are medium sized. Um, we put a bunch of different references in there where they definitely look a lot more human than actual frogs. Although one definitely does have more frog like proportions to them. Um, to kind of differentiate themselves from the grung, which are literal frog people, or the bullywug, which are also literal frog. There are a lot of frogs in Dungeons and Dragons, as I'm sure you are aware. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is more on the humanoid side of things, but we also included a tiny variant. So in case you wanted to play as sort of a pocket frog, um, and how would that play out? Because I'm always interested in playing with tiny options. As it may it's be. like playing the wizard's familiar, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, maybe you could play the wizard's familiar. <laughs> I mean, that's that's a j dab with a gig. So you that's know, a, that's a dab with a gig. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that could be like somebody joins the group, and you say, well, "Congratulations, you're playing the wizard's familiar." <laughs> Honestly, if I wasn't all that invested, I'd absolutely be down and then become invested yeah. if I was given that option. I know it, it totally worked. It could work with the right person who accepted. I mean, the wizard and the new player would both have to accept this. Uh, exactly. So, um, but in addition to this character option and fleshing out sort of the culture, we also looked into two different class options as well. So you have the Barbarian Path of the Speed Demon, which is playing off of, uh, I don't know if you remember Wind in the Willows or Mr. Toad's Wild Ride and how he was obsessed with driving cars and what have you and playing off of that idea that, oh, hey, they like to wheel and deal and work on machines and what have you. So it's like, all right, you have this rush. You need to go fast. We gave you an option for that. Um, on the other end, we have the Bubble Knight, which is the spider that produces bubbles that you can bounce around from. Um, and not necessarily working with wheels, but you're still moving fast to kind of perform a task, right? Right. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, the, you know, frogs can jump, right? So, I mean, yep. I mean if, you, if, you have, if, um, if the dab have the ability to jump long distances, right, that... I mean, that's right off the bat. It's pretty cool. They like, sure do. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> Maybe play a dab monk. It'd be fun. 
you know, we didn't really do enough testing with dabs and monks, but considering uh, how much your mobility increases as the monk, I can only imagine that it would be, inc that would be a really good combination. So sign um, me up, sign me up uh, someday, you know, we'll, uh, uh, you know, if you, if, you stream, if you stream a game of dab and um, you need uh, an old grognard, right, let me know. I'll oh, play, absolutely. I'll play a dab monk. That, that I'm inspired. I'm and do we get like long tongues? Like yes, you do. Off? Yeah. Um, okay. you can wield a thing as if it were your offhand. Um, it's got a reach of about five feet. There are feats that allow you to kind of extend it, use it to pull yourself towards objects. Although while using your tongue, you can't really speak all that well because you have a wiggle in the mouth, and it's very difficult. Oh yeah, let let my accents speak for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um but overall i'm really proud of how it turned out like everything worked together and what you did just there uh bringing up a uh, dab monk yeah. and the fact that i didn't consider a dab monk one that's that's something i need to figure out myself because i didn't consider one of the base classes no, let, let, let me come in and break it i want to come in and break it i want to be the guy that makes that that's the stuff i love i love finding about these synergies that just kind of organically come up within play <laughs> That's sort of the juice that gets me like really excited about building for this game, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the amazing thing is that this game has been around so long and, and here we are still coming up with new ideas for it. Yeah. I mean, still, right? Uh, it's, it's uh, oh, watch out for tongue-tied casters. Oh my gosh. Oh, now I'm thinking about a wizard type character uh, dab who cast spells um, uh, uh, with verbal components and the tongue goes out there and weaves like a glyph. <gasps> Doing know? somatic components with your tongue? Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> like, oh, you got me locked up. That's okay, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I hope someone got a screenshot of that too, by the way. No, I did it too fast, not a chance. <laughs> Oh, they can play it back in Twitch. I don't care. <laughs> not on the internet, that can embarrass me. I'm not even worried about it anymore. <laughs> verbal lashings, yes. <laughs> Tongue-tied, verbal lashing wizard, the glyph master. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like finding out about the sort of organic, like occurrences that happen within the game naturally like oh hey this mechanic and this mechanic produces this unexpected sort of reaction right. um that's really exciting in the testing phase it's really exciting to see once you put out something already out there after testing it's like oh hey i didn't count for this this is really cool um it feels fresh it kind of revives that sort of surprise emotion that's in the back of my brain yeah. it's really good yeah, I think a, a game, I, I just like, um, you should run a game uh, for me. <laughs> yeah, I'll take note. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, we could have a, a, a dab, a clon, and a tula, and I, you know, the, a wear squid, and like just go to town. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> it's crazy. It'd be fun. <laughs> totally. I'm down for it. I'm down. I'm totally down. <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> willie you, you're a great guy uh <laughs> but i was warned i was warned i was uh, you a lot of fans oh the rogue sneak attacks a sturge <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah a rogue a rogue dab sneak attack with the tongue yeah <laughs> got you got you <sighs> oh yeah we yeah squid bard yeah we're just um the chat has taken over uh the chat is effectively a recreation of what happens in my brain it's just sort of like these wonderful combinations sort of springing forth um it's that magical moment from ratatouille when remy is eating the strawberry and the cheese and you're seeing all those colors just kind of appear behind him and the right. jazz is playing and <laughs> this this is it right here on, on the right side of your screen there you go there you go yeah yeah. So um, it looks like uh, there's definitely a, a, a theme here in your work. A theme. There's a theme here. Um, like it's really, uh, you know, it's it's really offbeat. Is that fair? Yes. I mean, um, you know, it's all very unique. You know, you talked earlier about the... Um, influences for you growing up 
in the 90s and uh, anime and uh, S you know, SNES. Um, I wonder how many people got that reference. Um, uh, and you, you, you've, you've got a lot of that going on here. Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've caught on to this, but I'm a little weird. Um, in that regard, uh, generally, I do like things you don't see all that often. Right. Um, that are unique, that sort of pop. Um, and yeah, just sort of exploring things that don't necessarily exist as they do today um, is where I get my jam from. Well, and I think it's in a, I, I think it could be a good business strategy as well. Uh, it's, um, uh, there, there are other weird people out. You're not the only one. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, you can be their hero, Willie. <laughs> you know the clowns. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have a, uh, a few minutes left before I, I'm going to ask you my final question. What, um, uh, is there another project that, um, that you'd like to talk about for a couple of minutes before we... Uh... Uh, choo, 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 choo. there's probably not a lot I can talk about right now at the moment. Um, finished up a really cool like article for uh, MCDM's uh, Arcadia magazine. That's gonna be really um really nice. Yeah. Um, what what kind of article? Uh, what, what? It is a rule supplement that has to do with uh riding stuff like mounts your your oh, steed yeah. and whatnot right um and that includes a fun little adventure with that too um but well, what i the, like you know that the, I, I could see you would especially like to going to different uh types of creatures and stuff like that you could have the rider and the mount both be player characters right it's true um it, it took a bit to actually like kind of nail down how this article was going to work in particular, but we hit a nice balance based on what uh, Wizards of the Coast have kind of accomplished now with sort of their secondary character options, like, you know, your beasts, your playable uh, helpers and whatnot versus the classic mounts um, and figuring out a nice sort of synergy with the rules that work like that while also making them interesting, like, oh, hey, I want to use that. Right, um, right. But overall, it kind of ties into uh, what I really want to accomplish while working on Dungeons and Dragons. And that's to sort of inject dynamicy into the game. Well, well that's, that's a segue. That's my final question. What, mm -hmm. what is it that you w want to bring to this game that has been around for decades that um, so many amazing people have worked in? So yeah, there you go. Now I've answered, and now I've asked the questions. So now I've boom, been, I'll there it is. Yeah, um, but you fell into my trap. You see, I've been kind of setting this up, like oh, good. I love and uh, <laughs> leading into like sort of going down this rabbit hole of ideas and whatnot. Yeah. Most of them have to do with moving your character, how they move, how they sort of like interact with the world at large. I love dynamicy riding on a horse, moving fast, leaping across the sky, using multiple weapons, um, just getting your player character moving around and doing cool stuff within the heat of the moment, whatever sort of action scene you're in. Um, that makes sense. Like, I, I love to have that sort of dynamic silhouette as well, interesting, unique sort of faces appearing in the game, generally keeping the game amorphous, but still rigid and filled with pops yeah. um it sounds like i'm spewing a lot of words out but trust me when i'm saying this like i just want to see cool things happen I, and emphasis on happen i want to see cool things happen perfect that sounds great i mean i that's that's fabulous so um i'm gonna roll up a a dab monk who is a DJ, uh, just to yes. tie this back to the Book of House, you know, here. <laughs> oh, I cannot wait. You have my email. I want to see your character sheet. And we'll get oh. a game going probably, uh, um, let's let's say, uh, two Wednesdays from now. <laughs> <laughs> Wednesday, I have this show on the internet called Fire. Oh, huh. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay i can do it after the show okay that works yeah sure sounds good all right <laughs> well 
Willie, uh, what a pleasure. Uh, it's, it's been a delight. A, <laughs> I knew it would be. Like I knew, I knew we would have a good time together. And um, I thank you so much for being on our show. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right. Oh, stretch. I feel like uh, we did it. Double sided. You powered double, through it. A, a double header episode of Fireside. Yes. So, uh, yes, that indeed wraps up another episode of Fireside with Peter Atkinson on Gen Con TV. Uh, my next guest will be on October 28th, a week from now, and that will be Ashley Warren. And uh, yeah! I wait to um, have her on. Everybody talks. She was. Um, She's Happy been recommending Ashley. a lot of Ashley Warren fans out there. So, um, uh, but oh my gosh, that's a whole week away. So don't worry. We have a lot of other programming here on Gen Con TV between now and then. Um, on Friday, uh, we have Table Takes at 2 p.m. Pacific time with special guest Omari from the board game Brothers um, talking about the launch of their new Kickstarter for Hoop Gods and the second printing of Rap Gods. Okay. Um, and uh, on, on Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific, we have board games with Brothers Murph. On Wednesday at 1.30 p.m., we have board games with This Game Gets Dicey. And then at 4 p.m. on Wednesday, Pacific time, we'll be back with me. Uh, if you miss any of our shows, you can find all our streams about a day or so later on our Gen Con video YouTube channel. Uh, so please uh, check us out there. Also, a lot of my old episodes with uh, people who worked on Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons back in the 90s uh, is there as well. Uh, also, if you want to connect with any other Gen Con fans, check out the Gen Con Discord server. We are up and running. And um, so please remember to follow, subscribe, turn on notifications, and tell your friends about us. And so there we go. So thanks again, once again, to our guests for today, uh, Lydia Van Hoy and Willie Abiel, our studio manager, Marcus Mays, our producer, Derek Guter, to Dungeon Masters Guild for introducing us to the new voice of the Dungeons and Dragons to Gen Con TV for hosting us. And thanks most of all to you for watching.